be quite excited about today's session because I think there are going to be some key, key uh, messages to be shared. I would like to uh, welcome everyone who's already here. We've got people from all over. We actually have 94 registrations. So hopefully we'll have some that will still join us. But apart from South Africa, we've also got registrations from the Cameroon, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, Rwanda, the Sudan, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So we look forward to having uh, all these uh, people with us soon. And uh, then, as usual, I'd just like to thank the, um, uh, sorry, just give me a sec. Um, I'd just like to thank the um, ECHO, ECHO uh, group in New Mexico, Albuquerque, and the, also the group in, in India from ECHO that's supporting us. Uh, for Chris Cassianides, that uh, bring us all together. For Cheryl uh, Valentine, that um, assists with organizing these meetings. It's really very special, and uh, we really hope you enjoy it today as well. So today we have a um, special colleague that I've known for quite a long time, Dr. Petra Lisa Vessels. Petra Lisa works for the South African National Blood Service and is the person there um, tasked with helping and rolling out and organizing and teaching on patient blood management. So Petra Lisa, thank you very much um, for being with us today. And uh, Petra Lisa will, will start off with uh, giving us a bigger picture view of patient blood management as she sees it with some important medico, legal and other perspectives. And following Petra Lisa, I will share a very real and very interesting, in my opinion, case um, that I've recently seen and treated. So Petra Lisa, welcome. Can I hand over to you? Thank you very much. You're welcome Thank to you share so your screen. much. Thank you so much for again inviting Sanders. We do appreciate these invites and we, we really enjoy these sessions. I'm just gonna stop my video just for bandwidth purposes. Then I know at least my um, audio don't drag. So let's start. And again, thank you so much for inviting us and thank you very much for everybody who has joined. Um, so like Vernon said, I'm Pietro Lise Vessels and I look after patient blood management at Sanbus with my team and actually also with the teams in all of our blood banks. It's really a shared initiative between all of us. So this afternoon, I want to give you a slightly bigger, broader view of how we see patient blood management. Now, at the center of everything we do and you do, because that's why we're in healthcare, are patient outcomes. We wouldn't be here if we were not interested in improving patient outcomes. But circling that is a couple of things. There's the patient blood management, and I think we kind of clued up the, the visitors on this platform about patient blood management by now. There's health equity and there's ethics. And lurking there on the sidelines is this little guy with a very sharp pitchfork, and that is the law. And we cannot forget about him. Otherwise, we might get into trouble or we might actually get our patients into trouble. So let's start. The aim of this lecture this afternoon is very simple. It's to leave you with more questions in your mind than when you woke up this morning. And I'm not gonna tell you anything new. I'm just gonna take you on a very quick reminder tour of the stuff that you already know and perhaps did not realize all linked together. Let's start off with global health. So what is global health? Kaplan defines global health as an area for study, research and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all people worldwide. And now you start wondering about the term health equity. What, what is health equity? So the CDC defines health equity as being achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. And I want to stop here for a second and remind all of us that health potential 
does not only speak to physical health. Health is much broader in a human context. It's emotional health, it's mental health. So it's the whole holistic approach to health potential. Then I want to remind you of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So as you all remember, these were adopted in 2015 by the United Nations. And this was part of the call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030, which was quite a lofty goal. So you know these SDGs are integrated, and all of you remember that an action in one area will affect outcomes in other areas. And when you develop anything, there must be a balance between social, economic, and environmental sustainability. So that is the 17 SDGs. So for the purpose of this afternoon, I want you to remember seven of them. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, and reduced inequalities. So try to remember them as we quickly rush through the rest of the talk. Quick change of direction to iron deficiency, nothing new, just a quick reminder. You all know the negative impacts of iron deficiency. I'm not even going to read through them. You've heard them so many times. You all remember the negative impacts of iron deficiency on pregnancy and the risks to the baby and to the mother. And these are very serious risks. We sometimes forget that the fetal brain requires iron for normal development. But that is a very important fact that we should not be forgetting. You all know that iron deficiency will cause adverse perinatal outcomes, growth retardation, prematurity, low birth weight, and all of these come with significant mortality risks. Nice studies are done by the, on the effects of iron deficiency anemia on children. And you have read this, you have heard about this. I'm just a quick reminder. Uh, Lossoff and her group said that 20 to 25 percent of infants suffer from iron deficiency anemia, but even a larger percentage present with normal HPs and hidden iron deficiency. So when they followed up these children who was enrolled in the study as infants at the age 11 to 13, those difficult teenagers that the parents wants to kill sometimes, they find that these children with IDA are repeating grades, having reading and speech problems, attention problems, behavioral problems, and they are need to be referred to special services and tutoring, which are severely lacking in South Africa. So a chronic iron deficiency anemia has got a severe impact on the child's cognitive development to start off with, how he integrates in school, how he can actually uh, uh, progress at school, and then we wonder, or I hope we wonder, whether the problems we are seeing in our schools today, is it really just social pressure, peer pressure, lack of discipline? Are we not maybe assuming that it's that and missing the fact that iron deficiency can actually cause some of these problems? So then they went on and they followed up these infants until they were young adults. And what they found with chronic iron deficiency anemia, and now they are looking at 25 years down the line, 58% did not complete school, 76% did not pursue further studies, 83% were single, poor emotional health, and they actually never catch up to their non-IDA peers. They struggle to hold a job. And this is a cascade of adverse outcomes. Now you think back to the 17 SDGs and the seven I've highlighted to you, and you wonder how children in a poor socioeconomic environment who might have chronic iron deficiency anemia are ever going to reach those seven that I've highlighted to you. So the bottom line is iron deficiency is bad. But now after 25 years down the line, many of these ladies are childbearing age. Many of these ladies have got now a higher... Uh, burden on their iron stores and they become more deficient. They go into labor, often anemic. And what do we do? We treat it with a red cell transfusion. So as bad as iron deficiency is, treating it with a red cell transfusion is even worse. 
quick change of direction, patient blood management. I don't even have to stop and talk about the three pillars. You know that the World Health Assembly has adopted this uh, in 2010 already. You know that the core focus point is to timely optimize the patient's own red cell, and therefore you must diagnose and treat. You have to control and minimize blood loss and bleeding. You have to optimize and harness the patient's physiological reserves or tolerance to anemia, however you want to word it. And you must empower your patient. And your patient must have the opportunity. This is very much a multidisciplinary approach. So why do we do PBM? You also know this. Anemia is our common silent enemy, especially preoperative and iron deficiency. We have to mitigate transfusion risks. And you know, there's a lot being published on adverse events and dose dependent negative outcomes of allogeneic transfusions. There are several publications that speak to optimizing patient outcomes through the implementation of basic patient blood management principles. And we know that we are living in a resource constrained setting and we also know the iceberg effect, where the blood bill is just tip of the iceberg and all the hidden associated costs are the things that's actually draining our health budgets. This is the little guy with the pitchfork. So a quick reminder, and this is the South Africa National Health Act, and I would assume that all countries have got similar acts in place to protect the rights of the patients. So section six says the user must have full knowledge and the healthcare provider must inform the user. Section seven talks about the consent plus the fact that the, the patient needs information to be given to him or her. The patient must be allowed to participate in decisions. And yes, there are certain cases in which you can deliver a health service without consent, but that's not the majority of our patients. Section 13 speaks to our obligation to keep records. So now you all know this form. This is where you decide what cross match or what pre-transfusion testing you will choose. And that goes with a certain number of risks linked to the choice that you make. That is where you give us the diagnosis. What is the reason why you're exposing this patient to this risk? And the popular one is D64.9, anemia unspecified. I have never seen so many people in one country suffering from just one word, anemia. Then this is where you sign this form. This is a legal document linking it back to section 13 of the National Health Act your obligation to give good clinical records. And then there's this warning right over top where you say that in red, the doctor who orders the blood must take into consideration the risk of transmitting disease and is responsible for discussing the benefits and the risks of this therapy with the patient and for obtaining informed consent. All transfusions must be medically justifiable and alternatives must be considered. So my question is, if your diagnosis on this same form, a clinical record, reads anemia, how will you say that this was a medically justifiable transfusion? And if your clinical notes doesn't indicate that you have at least implemented patient blood management measures, how are you going to say that you have considered alternatives to transfusion? And the reason why I have shown you this form is because a friend of mine showed me this website on Monday. Litigation has become a reality in South Africa. This is a website of a legal firm in South Africa, and they say that malpractice claims can include faulty blood transfusions. They actually advertise that they will represent you in one of these cases. They also tell our popul patient population that they must look at their own medical records, charts and information. So your obligation to keep good clinical records goes further than just protecting the patient I think we also need to start protecting ourselves. 
So let's get to ethics. We all know where the word comes from. We know that's kind of a code of ethics. Uh, consists of all the obligation that we must respect as professionals as we go about our duties. And it's mostly the sort of the core values of our profession and the expected behavior which we should be adopting. You all know the four principles of bioethics. Again, nothing new. You know that the one is not more important than the other. They may be in conflict with each other. And in those cases, please get a second opinion, discuss the case, and whichever weighs the heaviest should be considered. Now your decision to transfuse, when you transfuse, what you transfuse, how much you transfuse should be based on these four principles. So let's start with autonomy. Competent adults have the right to decide what will and what will not be done to their bodies. And this is where informed consent comes in. And this is where you must tell your patient about those available alternatives, because when you order the blood, you sign on the form that you have considered the alternatives. This is where you have your duty to tell the patient of what other, what other options are available. Now, if a patient refuses treatment, you actually, when I was still a student, you actually often heard the answer, well, then there's nothing I can do with you for you. Patient blood management is not new. Patient blood management is not foreign. A patient that refuses a transfusion still has a broad spectrum of support and interventions we as doctors can provide to them. The principle of beneficence means we are to be of benefit to our patient. That means you cannot limit your patient's options just because your knowledge is limited. And that means if you do not apply patient blood management principles in your whole treatment plan, right from the preoperative phase, you are failing in your duty to be of full benefit to the patient. Non-maleficence means I must not harm my patient. I must not expose my patient to an unnecessary risk. We know that all transfusions are linked to risk. We know that these are dose dependent. So any unnecessary transfusion, any unnecessary number of products, inadequate knowledge of the treatment, I'm choosing the wrong product mix, I am choosing the wrong number of products to transfuse. I am not based, basing it on clinical evaluation, I'm basing it on just an HP value. My standard of care when I do the transfusion is not good. Me running for the uncrossed match blood in the emergency fridge where I could have applied basic management, PBM management uh, principles and could have waited for cross match blood. And then also in elective cases, treating preoperative anemia with a red cell transfusion. That is exposing your patient to an unnecessary risk. The principle of justice, equal and fair treatment of all our patients, and where wastage of a scarce resources in the South African setting may definitely impact on the greater patient population. And then taking it even further, in a resource constrained setting where our healthcare budgets get cut every year, and we cannot give our patients everything we would have wanted to give them. How can we justify using less cost effective treatment options in such a setting? So last part of the talk, I want us to ask ourselves a couple of difficult questions. First of all, is the absence of active anemia screening and treatment programs not hampering people's ability to reach their full health potential? Is a large part of our population not excluded from active anemia screening and management due to socioeconomic inequalities? What is being done about this inequity in access to healthcare? Are untreated anemias not contributing to these inequalities? If you think about the impact of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, and you take into consideration the SDGs, can we really ignore anemia any longer, especially in the setting of a low and middle income country? If PBM was considered to be a standard of care by the World Health Assembly more than 11 years ago, why are we only seeing patches of efforts in South Africa? 
If literature teaches on the negative effects of preoperative anemia, why are almost 49% of elective surgery patients still presenting anemic on admission for surgery and often treated with a red cell transfusion? If inappropriate transfusions were pro proven to impact negatively on patient outcomes, why are we still transfusing red cells to correct pre-op anemia in elective situations? In a resource constrained setting, is it justifiable to not use an option that was proven to be more cost effective? In a resource constrained setting, taking into consideration the cost of blood products, is it justifiable to perform an inappropriate transfusion just because we do not want to change the date of elective surgery? In a resource constrained setting, would it not make more sense to screen for and treat iron deficiency anemia to improve the general health, well being, and potentially also the socioeconomic activity of our general population? Do I know enough about transfusion medicine if I do think I need to transfuse? Do I know the difference between the, diff the pre-transfusion testing options and the risks I'm exposing my patient to? Do I understand specific product requirements for the underlying condition of the patient? Do I understand specific product indications? Do I know sp about specialized products and services that can actually be to the benefit of my patient? Do I know how to treat transfusion adverse events? What do I know about blood safety and blood risks? Do I know eno enough about alternatives because I'm signing on the form that I've considered alternatives when I order the blood? Intravenous iron, oral iron, who should get alternate days, who should get every day? What about cell saver technology? Have I considered it in my setting? Have I investigated the potential for it? What about tech and rotum use? Is there a place for that in my patient population? What about tranexamic acid? I've read so much about it in articles. Why is it not on my hospital's protocols? What is the quality of our informed consent processes? Are we allowing, allowing time and an environment for the patient to participate in this decision-making process? Are we sharing adequate information with our patients? Or are we sharing what we know? Are we making our voices heard through discussion platforms, drafting of policies and guidelines to fight for the best interest of our patients? And can we still justify not knowing enough? So blood transfusion, patient blood management, that whole realm of medicine might not be everybody's cup of tea. And therefore your enthusiasm and your experience will vary. But the HBCSA expects all of us to have adequate knowledge of the treatment that we expose our patients to and the tendency to limit the patient's option because the doctor lacks this adequate knowledge of treatment modalities that's well established for many years is ethically unfounded. Ensure that you have adequate knowledge of the options available and empower your patient with adequate and appropriate information and allow the patient to participate in the decision-making process. Last question, why do we bother to make a noise about this? Our purpose is trusted to save lives. This means the donor must trust us that we will use his gift to the benefit of patients and do no harm. You as the prescribers must trust us to give you a good quality product, but also to share information with you related to transfusion and patient blood management that is really important for both you and the patient. And the general public must trust us to be their voice and their advocate and speak out for them. Our vision is to be a cornerstone of healthcare services in South Africa. And we cannot do that without making our voice heard around patient blood management. This is my second favorite quote of all time. As we men of medicine grow in learning, we more justly appreciate our dependence on each other. The best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And in order that the sick may have the benefit of advancing knowledge, union of forces is necessary. 
It sounds as if this was written for patient blood management. It was written in 1910. And I think we need to start taking the advice. Thank you so much for your attention. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Well, Petraliza, that was fantastic. I think one of the best talks I've ever heard on this topic, and you've been, you were able to do it in 20 minutes, which is quite a feat. Thank you so much. Really fantastic. And uh, um, let's hear from the audience, or let me just uh, remind the audience uh, to feel free to add any comments or questions in the chat. Or if you have some questions right now, please put up your hands. Otherwise, I'll make an opportunity again at the end. So can I hear, are there anybody that uh, has anything to share at this point? Okay, it doesn't look like it right away, but there will be another opportunity just now. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And can I just confirm that in, everybody can hear me? All good, Vernon. We can. Fantastic. So this is a very real and very recent case of mine. And uh, I think today's presentation will be slightly different because it will not just be a case presentation where I will speak, um, although I will do the physical speaking, a lot of the speaking will be done by the patient's mother. And I've, um, at the end of my second consultation with her, I asked for permission to share this young man's story um, anonymously, of course, although she doesn't, didn't seem to mind, but I've done it, I'm doing it anonymously. And um, she summarized it to me in a long, long email. And I'm sharing and I'm going to share her voice today as well. But there is a huge lesson for all of us in this uh, presentation, I think, today. And even for myself, who works with iron deficiency so much, I have learned a lot from this patient. So let's begin the story. So everything starts in November of 2018, when this 14-year-old boy, RN, in grade 7, became ill with what was thought to be a viral infection that seemed to recover but three weeks after this feeling unwell he was dizzy and his mom was called to school to fetch him on a couple of occasions uh, according to his mom he was not terribly ill but he did not seem right there were no bleeding problems he followed a normal diet and she's a very caring mother as you will perceive as we go along took him to a pediatrician who found nothing, no postural hypertension. He did notice that there was a, microcyt a mild microcytic anemia, uh, but this uh, particular laboratory, this is a patient seen in private, um, referenced this hemoglobin as normal. No iron studies were done. Uh, some other things were done. His T4 was slightly decreased, but a normal TSH, cortisol normal, uh, but he was placed on oral iron empirically and told to come back in three months for follow-up iron tests. It was a difficult three months. He had ongoing dizziness. He was exhausted. He had great difficulty writing his exams. The mother went to discuss this with his primary uh, teacher, who was very supportive and understanding. But unfortunately, during the exams, he was screamed at by another teacher who was not in the loop about his health issues for resting his head on the desk. This Everything that you see in brackets was uh, quotations from the mother. So he went back to the pediatrician in February 2019. At this point, his iron levels were tested to see what it was after the uh, uh, three months of oral iron treatment. His ferritin was 15, hemoglobin was unchanged at 12.3. The T4 was still slightly decreased at, at 10, but a normal TSH. So the mother was told to wait another three months to see if the iron levels would improve on continued oral iron. The mother asked the pediatrician to be referred to a hematologist as her sister 
was dependent on iron infusions as oral iron didn't work for for her and that there was also a history with a grandfather who was requiring IV iron trans uh, infusions his whole life and in her in the mother's words she said i said to him that it would seem that there may be the possibility that there is some genetic iron issue i was told that there is no genetic component to iron deficiency we were told to keep on the oral iron for further three months when his levels be checked again we did this and during this period he started at a new high school across time uh, across town this was extremely difficult for him as the mornings were very early and the school was on very large grounds he joined school swimming in the afternoons but had to stop after feeling as if he would pass out in the water but another three months went by they went back the hemoglobin was now lower 12 ferritin was 18 and he was again told to stay on the oral iron by the pediatrician and he's now on iron for for nine months um actually for yes it's 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 uh yeah six months sorry his t4 is still low cortisol is now borderline and he's uh, the pediatrician refers him to an endocrinologist he had to wait more than three months for that appointment we had to wait a while for that appointment, uh, but started to play hockey. So the mother says, the first match I watched him play, I realized something was visibly not right. He barely picked his feet up to move across the field. He started missing more days of school, was not coping with PT, and the walk up three flights of stairs afterwards. The social and academic demands starting at a new high school were also very draining. Sees the endocrinologist. Who did a brain MRI, which was normal. He repeated the thyroid functions, which showed a TSH and a T3 that was normal, T4 again slightly low. All the other hormones was normal. ACTH stimulation test normal. So he diagnosed him with idiopathic central hypothyroidism and placed him on altroxin uh, to see what happens. He referred him to the ophthalmologist to check his vision, which was normal. But the mother says, I will say that the endocrinologist was not happy with the diagnosis and it was worrying him that something was being missed. I think he was waiting to see if the altroxin trial helped to improve how RN was feeling. He did not seem too concerned about the low ferritin, perhaps because he was still on oral iron at this point. But after heading out to visit my aunt, I learned that there are a few family members who seem to struggle with orthostatic issues. So we decided to repeat the test for orthostatic hypertension ourselves using our home blood pressure monitor. At this point, he had reached his, the full dose of altroxin, but it was clear that this had not sorted him out. The blood pressure readings we took did not show a drop, but we noticed that his heart rate went screaming up to over 150 beats per minute when he was stand, standing still, and at the same time, his feet and hands turned a blue-purple color. So they went to Dr. Google and found that this could be explained by POTS, postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome. So, he went, so they went back to the pediatrician who had not heard of POTS, but to his credit, he researched this immediately and wanted the patient to see a cardiologist. In the meantime, he had a follow-up appointment at the endocrinologist, who was still concerned that something was missed. So I discussed the POTS finding, and he was happy that the patient saw the cardiologist. In September, he sees the cardiologist, who did all sorts of investigations, found that his heart was normal, um, his lipogram was normal, the TSH was now very low, suppressed, and his TFT4 was normal, and he officially diagnosed him with POTS started the patient on beta blockers told to eat salty food and the mother dis says i discussed my concern about the iron at this consultation with a cardiologist and the cardiologist said he should stay on the oral iron started on the beta blockers which helped a little but he was still feeling tired went back to the cardiologist because of lack of response they changed the beta blocker to evabradine which is this channel interesting channel blocker which caused hypotension did more lab tests of all kinds which were all 
normal. But because of ongoing symptoms and feeling weak and hyper, becoming hypotensive, they went back to the cardiologist again, who changed him back to the beta blockers again. Also, he was sent to rehab physiotherapy. So now he had missed almost six months of school. He was still exhausted. We were put in touch with a rehab physio and uh, saw her for a few sessions to, with the hope of easing him back into schooling. The rehab physio was concerned about his hypermobility, but he did not seem to have hypermobile Ehlers Danlos based on his Biton score. So she called a rheumatologist col colleague who said that he should see a geneticist. And that was in 2019. So, still exhausted, told by the rehab physio that he should see an, a specialist internist with an interest in POTS. And she says, I was hopeful that he might help him further as the beta blockers were not doing enough to keep him functional. Uh, however, the same rehab physio told us that POTS was caused by anxiety and that he needed to see a psychologist. So he went to the psychologist for a few sessions while he attempted to start his grade nine year. Remember, we started in grade seven earlier. The psychologist referred him to a psychiatrist to rule out what we're missing. He also was sent to a biokineticist, but the exercises made him feel as if he were choking. And it soon became evident, given the size of the school, his level of exhaustion, that he was not going to be able to carry on with the school even though we had sought out the help of a rehab physio. So he was officially withdrew from school, beginning of 2020, started to look at smaller schools and tutors, but eventually ended up being homeschooled. Saw the psychiatrist who found nothing new. He saw the geneticist who said, maybe he's got a connective tissue disorder and told that there are some of these that could cause the POTS. Then went to the specialist physician in the beginning of 2020 who diagnosed him with post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome with associated POTS, changed him back from the beta blocker to the evabradine and a salt and water protocol. He's still on oral iron. So the mother dis says, I discussed my concern about the low iron levels with this internist. And I asked if he should be having an iron infusion or see a hematologist. Initially, I was told that it was probably a good idea for him to have the iron infusion, but I was also told the medical aid would probably not pay as his levels were not low enough. I said that we were prepared to pay if they refused, if it was something that would help him feel better. So they stayed on the oral iron. Went back to the physician. At this point, I brought up the issue of an iron infusion again. And at this point, the physician told her that he did not need this. So he was then referred to the neurologist. The neurologist did look concerned about his low iron levels, but we were not referred on. So now the patient gets a spinal MRI and scoliosis x-rays. So he has scoliosis. And because scoliosis can be con associated with a connective tissue disorder, uh, the neurologist asked that he sees the geneticist again to run genetic tests. Uh, to see if we could get further confirmation. Then COVID and lockdown came, but they were able to get back to the geneticist and with difficulty send the sample to the USA, where they found sort of a polymorphism actually in the col A12 gene of uncertain significant significance. But as this gene has been associated with connective tissue disorders, they said, well, maybe this could be playing a role. Year after, back to the psychiatrist online who says, I want to work with him as his condition is not just physical in origin and suggests that he also sees a psychologist again. The internist is not happy because the POTS is not improving. So he sends him back to the cardiologist, uh, in this case, a second cardiologist. The mum discusses the iron results with a second cardiologist, uh, but nothing is done. Then goes back to the to a second endocrinologist who is not convinced about the idiopathic central hypothyroidism and adrenal issues and wants to wean him off his hormones and suggests that he sees a hematologist. 
They try to get an appointment with him, hematologist number one, who is unfortunately not able to take any new patients. And his GP then referred him to hematologist number two, which was now me. So the story that the mother gives here is that all through these years, he has battled terribly with concentration, chronic fatigue, low mood and anxiety. He was only able to have his friends over for short bits before feeling exceptionally tired from concentrating on the conversation. He would go for walks with them and he would be back within 30 minutes to an hour. This would make him exhausted for a couple of days after seeing them. He was not able to keep up with all of his subjects. Attempting to walk or hike with him would mean that he got dizzy and exhausted after a while. When I took a history, there was no history of bleeding or blood donation. He followed a good diet with regular red meat, and there, was, there were no drugs known to interfere with iron absorption, nor any other symptoms suggestive of celiacs uh, or any other gastrointestinal disease that might be linked to iron deficiency. A family history was interesting. Maternal great-grandfather needed multiple iron infusions and blood transfusions for iron deficiency of unknown cause. He died at the age of 92. The maternal grandfather uh, had iron deficiency, unresponsive to oral iron, cause unknown. He had normal GNC scopes. His mother, who's the one talking here, gave a history of excessive bleeding post-op and postpartum. And the mother's sister had iron deficiency, only responsive to IV iron, which I think should leave us with a clue. Physical exam was essentially unremarkable and he had no postural hypertension. But this young, young man, um, who's now been going around for almost five years, he looked disheveled, he looked depressed, he looked just, you could see that it, he, he, he hardly spoke during the initial consultation. Um, he was really looking down. His pullback counts showed a normal, not a normal, a slightly low HP, 12.3, with a normal MCV and an MCH of 27. The rest was unremarkable. His serum iron was low. Transferrin was normal. Saturation was very low. The ferritin, according to the um, re reference ranges used by most lab, labs, was normal. But in this instance, I have to commend Pathcare who in the Western Cape at least have changed their reference ranges to indicate that this ferritin would be low in the context of a low saturation. We're still trying to convince other labs to do the same. So my plan was to get a gastroenterologist to evaluate him as he has got an unexplained iron deficiency in a, in a male and it, I suspected some kind of absorption issue, malabsorption and uh, wanted to have their opinion on that and also planned after him being on oral iron which the mother in the meantime by the way had stopped because of no response but who, on, on which he was for about two or three years to give him IV iron so he saw the gastroenterologist who did not want to do scopes because according to those blood results in his opinion he did not have iron deficiency I sent him for an intravenous iron infusion. He had a reaction to, to Monifer, which fortunately is rare, but he had one. He was switched to Venifer, received two doses. Six weeks later, came to see me for follow-up. So the mother is speaking. Within a few weeks of his iron infusions, we started to notice a tremendous difference in his ability to concentrate. The first time a friend came over after his infusions, they went out for so long that um, I started to wonder if they were okay. It was hours. For so many years, he was home so quickly. He was still exhausted after this, but the exhaustion lasted for a shorter time, and he was still able to carry on with his schoolwork at the time. It was a much shorter crash. Out of his own volition, he also started hopping on the treadmill at home and is now running on the treadmill almost daily. This was not previously possible to any functional level. For the first time, I feel hope for his future. Overall, his mood, energy levels, and concentration are greatly improved. He's now able to pick up his studies more normally again. He has registered to write his exams at the end of the year. 
Many of the investigations, it's all this is still the mother speaking, many of the investigations did reveal important health issues along the way, but he re really remained unnecessarily dysfunctional through most of his teen years. As I said, when we left your rooms early in the week, it makes me ecstatic to see him feeling so much better. But at the same time, there's a great sadness to realize that he was in unnecessarily in that state for so long. This was particularly the case when I realized that I had expressed concern from the very beginning about his iron and had brought it up numerous times along the way. It feels good to feel that his suffering and experience will be used to try and highlight the importance of sorting out this issue first, referring to my talk today, which I told her about. I feel that the statement, doctors can tolerate the feeling of iron deficiency far better than patients can, used by the nurses at the infusion center, is more, most humorous and apt. Sister Karen Davidson uh, apparently made this comment. I imagine that it is sometimes very difficult to get a sense from seeing a patient for a short while away from their daily functioning of the difficulties iron deficiency may be causing. I would also like to add that besides the financial and time burden that results from not dealing with this first, there is an enormous cost to the rest of the family who are not iron deficient on top of the patient's difficulties. Our family has had outings cut short, uh, bonding time interrupted. His siblings have not interacted with him as much as they would have liked. Sometimes his frustration at his health, which sadly but understandably came out of, come out of them. I'm not sure if the deficiency can also cause irritability. The answer is, of course, yes. And the worry and struggle that we as parents have had really to, taken a toll on the entire family unit. Thank you so much. This has resulted in him getting his life and future back, even though he still has spots. Well, maybe, and a connective tissue disorder which will need management for life. He's actually talking about what field he wants to go into, whereas before he was worried about his ability to hold any future employment. Now his HP was 13.4, his iron, transferrin, saturation, and ferritin were all normal. So I'd like to remind everyone that these are the symptoms that we see in iron deficiency, and you will note that most of these are seen in more than half of patients. And it's not just fatigue, but all of the things that he, he complained of, psychological palpitations, fatigue, et cetera, dizziness, can all be explained by iron deficiency for reasons that I've set out in many other talks and some talks that we'll put out in future. We must be reminded that iron deficiency anemia is the end stage of iron deficiency, that you can have all the symptoms even if you are you are not anemic. And we call that non-anemic iron deficiency. And it's more severe in some patients than in others. If you use the old cutoffs of ferritin less than 15, you will miss 43% of cases. If you use a, a cutoff of less than 30, you will miss only 8% of cases. And he was one of them. And you need to add the transferrin saturation. His ferritin was 53, but his sats was 9. His CRP was normal. He had clear iron deficiency and he needed treatment. And you diagnose it simply like this. If the ferritin is less than 30, you treat. If it's 30 to 100 with the sats less than 20, you treat. If it's more than 100 and your sats are less than 20, well, then we can do further tests to make sure. B12 and folate were normal in him, but must always be considered. And when you treat, treat to goal. HP normalized, that's more than 13 in men, and your SATs needs to be above 20, and your ferritin more than 100. He's reached all his goals, and his life is changed. And I want to quote on my final slide, Donald Rumsfeld from US Secretary of Defense, that said, as we know, there are known knowns. These are things we know we know. But they're also known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also, and this is the case for him, in all the doctors I think he saw, unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And the most dangerous of these, in my opinion, are the ones we think we know, but we don't know. And these are the difficult ones. And this is why 
we have these sessions and I want to thank you all for your attention and we would really welcome any discussion and questions for myself or um, for Petra Lisa. Thank you so much. So, some comments in the chats. Chris, I think you had you showed your hand oh, there. Let's Berman, hear. Petra Lees, I'm, I sit through nearly every G, G Echo session, I mean, over the last year or so, and I don't think I've ever come across a session with such an instructive case. So, Vernon, congratulations. I mean, th this is powerful, and we need to repeat this. And Petra Lee's an excellent presentation. I mean, we are not aware of the legal or ethical issues that you really so clearly uh, put out there. Vernon, the problem is that most physicians still are, are not, it's not a matter of, it's, it's a matter of awareness more than education. And, and the first big, big problem we have is making people, physicians aware that patients with non-anemic iron deficiency are symptomatic. That, that is the big question. I mean, people look at hemoglobins and irons and B12s, and if they're not anemic, they, they ignore what follows. So, so the big, big issue here is to make people aware that yes, you can have profound symptoms of, as you've shown with, um, with non-anemic iron deficiency. The problem too is that it's not linear for every milligram per deciliter, whatever they are, ferritin, you're going to get dropped, you're going to get more symptoms. Exactly. You have patients with, with quite compensated ferritins, which might be borderline, or depending on what lab you use, and have very, you know, profound symptoms. And then you have others that have profound drops in ferritins, running ferritins of five or 10, and then don't really have uh, much in the, in the way of symptomatology. So can you, from a physiological point of view, explain why we have this kind of discrepancy in symptoms? Is it age-related? Is it sex-related? Is it etiology? Does that have a, a, a role to play? Because this, this is a big problem, trying to correlate this mm. enormal, enormous array of symptoms, variety of symptoms, with the degree of iron deficiency as reflected in a ferritin level. Sure, Chris, you couldn't have summarized it better. And that's my experience as well. I've, I've seen patients, um, I saw a, a, a young man, a young medical student, as a, actually a young medical doctor uh, recently who had profound iron deficiency, but not yet anemic. And he had virtually no symptoms. Um, apart from mild fatigue, whereas other patients have extreme symptoms. And, I, and, and it's not very well explained. The, other, the question is, of course, whether um, there are genetic elements that predispose them and or whether in this instance, it's a growing teenager in undergoing puberty where every cell in the body is in even greater need of iron that all his systems that are busy developing still are grinding to a halt and struggling because I, I, I do see, it, it sometimes seems to me that, that these young, young people do have more symptoms, um, but I don't have a good answer for that. But I have seen patients who have non-anemic iron deficiency who are much more symptomatic than patients with significant iron deficiency anemia. And that's where we need a lot of research still. Um, the other question, of course, is with someone who we suspect is not absorbing iron and um, whether he's perhaps also not fully absorbing other things that we have not found. I mean, there are so many um, trace minerals and things that we do not routinely test for. Could it be that there's a contributing factor for some of those that are also perhaps not absorbed if you have some, some uh, gastrointestinal genetic or inherited uh, absorption issue? I don't know. Some people in the chat group have uh, thought about Irida. I thought about that. I didn't feel that Irida completely explained the whole profile, but it's certainly something that, that one thinks of. And more and more, I'm starting to think that we should really get uh, maybe some of the labs to consider um, 
having some iron panels for us because they're also very interesting um, genetic things giving us high ferritins without iron overload there's before for instance uh, the benign hyperferritinemia syndrome with normal sats and high ferritins came across a case like that that today where um, there's a, a genetic issue with the l ferritin uh, which is the ferritin of course consists of heavy chains and light chains and if there's a problem genetically with the light chain the ferritins are high but there's nothing else so i think we should start thinking about this the interest in iron i think is great enough and i've got myself got so many patients with this profile of no clear cause but i'm going to ask you a question uh, um, chris what do you think um, about uh, further in examination of the gastroenterological tract in a young man like this. Just remind me of his age. Well, this all started when he was uh, 14. So it's, uh, he's now 18 and a half. Well, I mean, you know, celiac has to be excluded and can be simply done with a, with serological assays. So okay, I've done that and that was normal. So in this case, having corrected the iron deficiency, I, I mean, I don't think I would burden him immediately. I would watch off iron what happens. And certainly if he drops any of his levels, he just goes straight to pan endoscopy. That's what that's so that was the um, the conclusion or the compromise that we came to. I assured the mother that we will not let him down, that I will see him again for follow-up in three months to see what happened in three months after full IV iron replacement um, and if we're not happy then we have to take it further. Having said that if you had contacted me the first time you contacted a gastroenterologist I would have pan endoscope too. Okay okay no thank you for that that's that's good to, to know. I'm, I'm, there's so many comments in the chat. Please, people, look at it. I think there's a great discussion going on. I've never seen a discussion as active as this in any <laughs> talk I've given. Had, I think. We've never had a case like this, Vernon, and a talk yeah, well, like this. No, half, half of it is, half of it is <laughs> We're spinning release. here. <laughs> <laughs> Petra Lee's, uh, you can also see there. Um, let me quickly see whether there are any specific questions. Um, yeah, I must also agree, Antoinette, hats off to the mum for fighting for her son. Yeah, awesome story, hey. And then H. pylori testing. Let's hear from our gastroenterology colleagues. What do you think about that? Somebody asks H. pylori. Stephanie Kennedy asks about H. pylori testing. And Mashiko, you've also, maybe Mashiko, yeah, she's on a comment. Let's hear, what does Mashiko say? Come, Mashiko. <laughs> H. pylori queen of sub-Saharan oh. Africa. Oh, wow. No, thank you to both of you. I thought those uh, talks were just incredible. Um, I was going to ask Chris whether he would have done any endoscopy when the patient was initially referred. Um, and I also did consider a celiac disease, given the family history and everything else that uh, the young uh, gentleman presented with. And I think there is the concept of seronegative celiac disease. So Vernon, I definitely would have done an uh, OGD, a gastroscopy, uh, to look for H. pylori. Uh, and definitely to do duodenal biopsies, uh, even if the celiac serology is negative. And then if that was negative, if, so if there was no marsh, uh, significant marsh on the biopsy, in this gentleman, I probably would do HLA testing, just to put celiac disease to bed, uh, you know, once and for all. Mm. Um, and then uh, H. pylori, I mean, if you have non-invasive tests, then uh, definitely it should be done. Uh, but if I was going to do a G-scope anyway for duodenal biopsies, then I would test for H. pylori uh, with a rat test. So yes, definitely H. pylori testing. And if you don't have facilities to test, then just uh, treat empirically in a young person who lives in South Africa with unexplained um, iron deficiency. Thanks. Okay, that's great. And I'm making notes as you put, speak. Just put it in perspective in Masheko, we must be careful that H. pylori is a rare cause of iron deficiency. So you don't want a patient where you're attributing H. pylori as the cause having not done a colonoscopy and missed major pathology in the colon. This is really a cause that I would consider once I've excluded, uh, you know, major, excluded 
uh, major pathology. But having said that, if you're going to pick it up, you just treat it. But it's, it's, a, it's an unusual cause of iron deficiency. There's a lot of other causes that we've got to consider before we consider H. pylori. And H. pylori is very common. Uh, iron deficiency is very common, so it's going to be overlapped. Great. It's seven, it's 5.30. Again, a big thank you to the Gastro Foundation, who with Project ECHO runs these meetings. Chris, can't thank you enough. Cheryl, um, the PBM ECHO team, or the, G -ECHO, or the, the, the Project ECHO team, both in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and in India. Thank you for your support, also the technical support. And... Uh, we really want to invite all of you to come and join us again next week. You can see the title on the screen um, for uh, some case presentation on inflammatory bowel disease. And there's going to be an interesting discussion on Beshe's. You can see it there. Please come. And uh, I really, really appreciate all of your presence. And I agree with you, Chris not to bore anybody to death, but I also feel like I want to share this case on another platform um, and I will probably still find one somewhere because I think it tells a story that we cannot ignore. So thank you and have a lovely evening, everybody. Thanks, Vernon. Bye -bye. Thanks, Petrolese. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye, Christian. <laughs> Our good friend. <laughs>